If you would, please open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We'll be back in our study of 1 Thessalonians today, and I am really excited to be able to jump into God's Word with you in this portion of Scripture. However, if it is your first Sunday with us, this will be a unique time to study with us because we're in a transition point in the book that's very interesting. You remember we've been studying this wonderful church, a church, as you know, that is as healthy as any church we have in the New Testament. In fact, if you were to study all of Paul's writings, all of his letters, all of his missionary journeys, there's two churches he speaks about the highest, and that is the church in Philippi and the church in Thessalonica. We might say that he has more good things to say and he's more encouraged about them than any other churches we find in the New Testament. And when we find this church in 1 Thessalonians, you remember they're probably around six months old. This is a young, new work, a church planted by God some six months prior to Paul writing them from Corinth. And when Paul writes this letter to them in in response to Timothy coming and giving him a report, what we find is this church is not just doing okay. This church is thriving. They are striving. They are growing. And it's not just that they're doing good in easy circumstances. This church is suffering. It is difficult to be a Christian in Thessalonica. We spent two chapters studying their incredible responses to living for Christ when it costs them. This church is about as healthy as it gets. And so when you run into chapter 4, verse 1, and he says, Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus. What he says next is a little bit arresting. I mean, I think all of us might wonder a bit, after spending three chapters, and in here we have spent some 17 weeks in the first three chapters, When he moves in to exhort them and encourage them, I don't know if the top of our list would have been that he was going to give them strong exhortations about sexual purity. I mean, it catches you off guard a bit in chapter 4, verses 1 to 8, when you think of all we've been hearing about the health of this church. And here's what's amazing. Sometimes we come to 1 Thessalonians 4, which is an entire discussion about the danger of sexual immorality, and we kind of relegate this passage to personal discipleship. We kind of put it in the realm of those that are really struggling. You know what? We'll go to 1 Thessalonians 4 when you're having a really hard time in your life with personal purity. But do you know that he doesn't write to them because they're struggling. He actually writes to them in light of the fact they're being pure. This isn't a message to the struggling. This is a message to the striving. This isn't a message to the failing. This is a message to the winning, the battle over temptation. In fact, just look at it for a moment. Verse 1, Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus, just as you received from us instruction, how you ought to walk, that's the pattern of life, And please, God, notice this, just as you're actually doing. Verse 2, you know the commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus, and the idea is, and you're living in them. So that begs the question, why write to a church about purity that's actually doing well in personal purity? He's not addressing them because he's heard reports they're struggling. He says, you're obeying the Lord in the things I've taught you. I've been there, I've instructed you on these areas, and you're doing well. It's very interesting. Paul was so concerned that these types of truths be brought before the church on a regular basis. If you look at chapter 5, just turn over there really quickly. He says in 527 that he wants these topics, even the topic of sexual purity, he wants it noticed, chapter 5, verse 27, I adjure you by the Lord to have this letter read to all the brethren. The idea is regularly bringing this topic before the people. Paul wanted it read often. 
What is Paul indicating to us today, Cornerstone Bible Church, when he decides to take a discussion about sexual purity and address a church that there's no indication that they're struggling in this area on the whole? Why do that? Because Paul knows this reality, that this area of personal purity is not an area that we ever graduate from. It's not an area that as if you grow and you excel and you strive and you hit this, 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 uh, this idea of arrival, that I no longer need to worry about my personal purity. I mean, sometimes we talk about it like this, don't we? We say, well, we'll go to 1 Thessalonians 4 and let's have an exhortation time to the men. But the ladies, you guys are okay. You don't need to worry about 1 Thess 4. Nope. He says, finally, then brethren, all of you. Or sometimes we think, oh, let's have a singles conference. Let's get all the singles together. The married couples don't need to come. Let's talk about purity. Nope. Paul says, I'm addressing all of you and each one of you need to consider these truths. Why is that important for us? Because what Paul is showing to us, whether your age, your stage, whether you're Jew or Gentile, whether you're spiritually mature or you're struggling, whether you're single or you're married, whatever season of life, whatever stage of life, whether you're young in the teen years or you're aging towards perfection, Wherever you stand, Paul is saying, you need to hear this. You need an exhortation, even if you're doing well in this area, on purity. Why? Because this is one of those areas that no matter how much you study it, no matter how much you swim in the depths of the passages of these truths, it is one area, if you let your guard down, Satan is ready to exploit you. Do we have to look in the Old Testament? David, let his guard down. It took him down. How about Solomon? There's a lot to learn from him. You know, it's interesting when you think about Solomon in light of Paul's exhortation to us. Solomon wrote these words to his boys in Proverbs 7, 24 to 27. Just listen to him. Now, therefore, my sons, listen to me. So he's talking to Rehoboam and whatever other sons are there. Pay attention to the words of my mouth. Do not let your heart turn aside from their ways. Do not stray from their paths. Here's the reason why. For many are the victims she has cast down. Many have fallen into great sexual sin. And numerous are her slain. Every time I read that verse, I don't want it to say many. I want it to say a few. A couple. Many. Numerous. He exhorted his boys on that. Boys, here's the danger. Here's the struggle. Guard your hearts. And you know what rebuke is hidden in the white spaces of that section? The man that spoke it defied his own counsel. 1 Kings 11, 3 and 4. For when Solomon was old. So he listened for a while to his own counsel. His wives turned his heart away after other gods. Paul knows that no matter what age or stage, no matter where you're at in your maturity, what we learn from men like Solomon, what we learn from David, what we know about the human heart is no matter where you sit today, believer, if you're mature and striving and you're winning the war within or you're struggling, you never outgrow the need to be exhorted in the area of purity. And this is not just a a casual conversation by Paul here. In fact, These are strong exhortations that comes with a serious warning. To reject these exhortations is to fall into the hands of a God who will avenge himself against you. And yet Paul brings this to a healthy, wonderful, thriving, striving church. Which says for us today, beloved, we never outgrow the need to be exhorted in the area of purity, do we? Let's read the section together. Chapter 4, verse 1. Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus. Notice request and exhortation. He's doubling down to get their attention. 
that as you receive from us instruction, how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually walk, that you excel still more. Four, you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. When we were with you, we taught you all about purity. Verse three, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is that you abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. And let no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter because the Lord is the avenger of these things. Just as we also told you and we solemnly warned you. For God has not called you for the purpose of impurity but in sanctification. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. What a charge to a healthy church. What an exhortation and a warning. There's no way we'll be able to cover all eight verses today, but we're going to cover some of it today, and I think it'll be helpful this week and next week. And so if you want to know how we're going to frame up verses one to eight, it's going to basically be a simple outline, and I hope you can track with it, because my goal is in your battle against temptations, you can take these truths right with you into your fight. So here it is. Here's our outline if you're taking notes. Four motivations to pursue purity. Four motivations to pursue purity. Here's your first motivation. We're going to get at the the heart level here, which Paul's at. What is the first motivation to pursue purity? And here it is. Ready? Greater purity is needed. If you want to be convinced you need to pursue purity, let's start with just the reality that you have not arrived. You're not as pure as you should be yet. For if the standard for purity is God, I don't think any of us are going to say, we made it. Yep, I'm there. No, we're going to say, I need more. I need to grow. So point one, why you need to grow greater purity is needed. But I not only get that from that comment, I get it from the authority of the text. I want you to see this. Paul's actually going to tell this church, I know how healthy you are, but you still need to strive more. I know you're growing and you're striving and you're winning the battle, but greater purity is needed. I want to see you hit another level. How do we know that? Look at the end of verse one, that you excel still more. Now here's what's interesting. In the middle of verse one, he tells them, we've already taught you on this. I've already, look at it. You've received instruction on how you ought to walk and please God. We've given you instruction on purity. And then verse two, he gives a reason. Here's here's a basis on, on how we know that you know these things. Look at verse two. For you know the commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. As apostles of Christ, when we were with you, we sat down and discipled you. Think of that. He's saying, we discipled you. We taught you, we went house to house, and we covered every topic, including the topic of purity. He's saying, beloved, what we're about to learn in verses two to eight was basically Paul and Silas and the men, this was their discussion with this church on purity. And this wasn't a church that was hearing these things and being double-minded. They weren't the type of person that sits and receives instruction from the word and listens to it and goes right back to their lusts. These were a group of people that were winning the battle. Look at the, the middle of verse one. Just as you ought to walk and please God. So walk is a pattern of life. Please God is motivation. Not only are you walking in obedience, your motives are to do it because you love God and his glory. And he says, just as you actually are already doing this, I want you to excel still more. Excel still more is an interesting concept there that he gives because it has the idea to have an overabundance of something, to have more than you need. It's even used to describe like having a basket of fruit. You filled the basket of fruit up to its brim. You can't put any more in there and you have an overabundance of what you need. It's falling out. It's more than you need. That word is then pulled into Um, areas of life where you may see, I have all that I need. He's saying, yeah, but you need more. So if you come here today and you say, 
I'm winning the battle against sexual impurity. I'm fighting and I'm winning the war within. He's saying, yeah, but it's not enough because you haven't reached God status yet. You still need to excel. I want you to have an overabundance of purity. And I'm sure nobody in here is saying today, well, I already have an overabundance of purity. (laughs) He's saying you need to excel beyond where you're at in personal purity. And he says you do that by, look in the middle of verse one, walking and pleasing God. You know, this is, this idea of pleasing God, you know, when we start talking about strong exhortations to please God, to live a sexually pure life, when he says pleasing God, he's getting at the idea of motivations. Believers don't strive to obey God to live a more pure life, to excel more so they can come before God and present themselves having some righteousness that makes them acceptable. When he says you do this in a way that pleases God, he's saying you know that God has saved you. You put your faith in Christ, died and risen and ascended to the right hand of the Father. You are forgiven. But because you love God so much and you love his glory so much and you're so grateful that he saved you, when he says he wants more from you, you say, okay, what do you want me to do? I want to honor you more. I want to please you. Well, beloved, here today, God's telling us no matter where you're at in your victory over sinful impurities, no matter how many years you've strived to win the battle, no matter how many battles you have behind you where you've won the war within, He says, I want you more pure because it pleases God. And you think this is hard for us in America? Some scholars believe it would have been harder to live a sexually pure life in Thessalonica than even in our sensual culture in America today. You say, why do people say that? Well, some would say that America at least has in its history by our framers, And our founders, even upon our constitution, a moral framework. There was written into the fabric of of this, uh, this republic when it came together, moral principles and biblical values. And while our culture is descending into doing everything they can to scrub those out so no morality convicts them, nevertheless, there still is a residue of morality that hangs around pockets of society. Rome had no history like that. There was nothing in their framing and founding on morality. In fact, godlessness, sensuality, the celebration of impurity as an act of worship was in the culture. The goal of life in the Roman Empire that the Thessalonians would have lived in, this is going to sound familiar to our American ears, was life's purpose is for you to serve and satisfy self and to pursue happiness and what makes you feel good. The self was the center. And in a sexualized culture in the Roman Empire, a city rich with wickedness in Thessalonica, nobody was about to tell them about some morality that would keep them from finding happiness in sexual fulfillment. That was what makes me happy. I'm going to do what I want. Sin and temptation in the realm of impurity was all over the Thessalonian culture. And everywhere they looked and everywhere they went, this this sensualized, sexualized idea would have been thrown in their face and celebrated. And so these people get saved and they come into the church and guess what? That's all around them. Well, whether living in Thessalonica or America is more difficult, we know this, there is a common ideology in the center of American life that we live and the Thessalonian life. And that is this. That our society teaches that you should do whatever makes you happy. And anything that's a threat to your happiness and your self-fulfillment is therefore keeping you what you were made to do. And if Sexual fulfillment outside the boundaries of what God says outside of marriage makes you happy. Well, guess what? No Christian, no culture, no moral norm is going to keep me from getting what makes me happy. We've seen this in our culture. It continues to descend. I'm sure some of you that lived in times far 
before we live today, <clears throat> grieve over what's been lost in society. But what has happened is the self has replaced God. And when the self is at the center of everything and self means happiness. And if I live for myself, that is happiness. And if flaunting my sexual desires bring me happiness, that's what I'm going to do. Like it or not, get out of my way. That's our culture. Well, that was happening in Thessalonica. And guess what happens when that surrounds a church? People get saved from that culture. Many of you have been saved from sensual, wicked, ungodly lives of the past, just like these Thessalonians. They were coming out of all types of wickedness and they come into the church and guess what happens? It's like being dropped in cold water. Whoop, whoa. I just went from godless thinking, godless ideologies, wicked self-worship, sensuality, to a whole bunch of people striving for purity, avoiding ungodliness, fleeing from wicked things, striving to have biblical godly marriages, running from promiscuity and ungodliness. And all of the sudden, the church becomes a place where it can be difficult sometimes because people are coming out of so much sinfulness. So what does Satan do? He wants to desensitize the church. Just like here, he wants the church to think less about the evils of sexual sin. He wants the church to think it's not as big of a deal as the Bible says it is. He doesn't want us to be looking at past, like verse 8, he who rejects this is not rejecting man but God. He doesn't want us looking at verse 6. If you transgress or defraud a brother in the matter, the Lord's coming as an avenger. Satan's great goal, if he can't keep you from the gospel, beloved, and God saves you, if he can't take you to hell, I've told you this before, he wants to ruin your testimony along the way. And the way he does that is desensitizing the church from thinking as with much robust and clear convictions about purity, which is why Paul's writing this. So this church would not be desensitized because just like us, it was all around them. You know how this can come about in the church. Someone could be living in unrepentant sexual sin and should be discipled seriously or church disciplined and that comes before a church and the church says, no, we can't do that. Do you know what that would mean for our church if we church discipline someone out of our church for living that way? There's a lot of people that live that way here. Yeah, it would purify your church. And it would protect the people from wolves. People say, if we teach that standard, if we teach God's standard, we call people to that, there's no way. Everyone lives in this. Everyone struggles. And this is just the way of life as if we all just fail all the time. As if because men fail, that changes God's standard. This is how Satan desensitizes the church. Paul says, we must not do that. You need to look back at verse one at the end, excel still more. You not only need to know the standard for purity, but no matter where you find yourself, you need to grow and become more pure. You need to be more righteous, more godly, renewing your mind more quickly, fleeing faster from temptation, avoiding more things that could be dangerous to you. It needs to be another level of excelling. Get after it, Thessalonica. So I ask you what I asked myself this week, dear ones. What part of your heart does God want you to excel more? Where? What part of your life, what part of your heart that only you and God see, does he want you to excel still more? What is God after in you? What area have you let your guard down? Where are you letting things into your eyes, listening to things with your ears, hanging around people you shouldn't hang around, reading novels you shouldn't read, <laughs> watching things you shouldn't watch, thinking on things too long that you shouldn't think on. Where is God convicting you, beloved, to excel still more? My old pastor, Jerry Ragg, used to say, when it's just you and Christ, that's who you really are. So when it's just you and Christ... Where does God want more purity? Brothers, where does God want you to grow? Where does he want you to excel? What context does he want you to be more sober-minded and alert about its dangers? With what people? Where does he want you to be more careful, dear brothers? 
Ladies, how could you be more pure? In what ways could you work to have your attire be more modest, your thoughts more circumspect, more careful about the way you handle yourself in ways that could be enticing? What could you do? Where does your mind linger? Where do you let it go that the Lord is saying, dear sister, excel still more? You know, I was thinking about this this week in my own life. I've been a follower of Christ 16 years. I've been in some kind of hanging around formal ministry context for over a decade. I've taught on purity. I've taught multiple series on purity. I've been taught well on purity. I've read books on purity. I'm teaching on purity today. I've taught through the Proverbs on purity. And I've been exhorted on purity. And yet, I was asking myself this week, Darren, where can you excel still more? And even this week, if I could just encourage you, I've just had those three little words in my mind. If there's any way in any context, I just say to myself, Darren, excel still more. Where does God want more of your heart? Where does he want more purity? Where can you grow? Where can your mind be renewed faster? Where can you battle more fiercely? Where can there be a more blood earnest desire to win the war within? So let me exhort you in the same way as he starts here. He hasn't even got into the fullness of discussion and he says, just take an inventory. Where can you excel? Where does God want more of your heart? So the first motivation for us to live a pure life, to pursue more purity, is greater purity is needed. Second motivation, that's the first, greater purity is needed. Second motivation, to pursue a pure life is this, and it's very simple, and it comes right from the text again. It's God's will for you. It is God's will for your life that you live a sexually pure life. Where do we get that? It comes right from the text. Look at verse three. For this is the will of God. And when biblical authors say this is the will of God for something, they're calling us to pay attention for a moment. They're about to put something before us that declares to us in a very precise way what God wants from us. Notice it. This is our second point, our second motivation. It's God's will for you. This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality and that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. It goes down, the argument continues in verse 5, not in lustful passion like the pagans or Gentiles who do not know God. He continues in 6, and let no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter because the Lord is the avenger of all these things. The will of God for your life as it pertains to sexual immorality and sexual purity is found right here. Now let's think about the will of God for a second because it's important. When you run into this is the will of God in scripture, there's two different ways the will of God is put before us and it's good for you to know what's happening. There is the will of God put before us that is putting God's sovereign will. Some call it his secret will, where God is unfolding his plan, but he hasn't notified humanity all that he's doing. Like Matthew 6.10, let your will be done, God, on earth as it is in heaven. Or James 4 When it says, if the Lord wills, let him unfold his plan. This is God's will. This is God's secret unfolding of his sovereign plan. That's one will in God. God has a second will that's not secret or not sovereign. It's revealed. This is the one he wants us to know about. This is the declared will. The will of decree. The will of desire. The will of obligation. And I bring those two wills before you because when this second will is put in place, it's bringing an emphasis, almost like this. Pay close attention. I'm about to show you what God speaks super clearly about. Don't miss it. It's his will of decree. He wants you to know it. He doesn't want you to miss it. So notice, very interesting. When he says this is the will of God for you, he says your sanctification. We'll talk about this as we unfold this passage, but sanctification is very important for us to think about because God's will for us starts with us being more sanctified. And if I might just step back, if you want to ask any question in your life about any decision you want to make, is this God's will for you? If it's going to lead you into unholiness 
or impurity or sensuality or ungodliness, I promise you, no matter how much you feel it's good, it's not God's will. God's will always has to do with you becoming more holy and sanctified. So if you're wondering about any decision you make, what you should do, where you should move, who you should spend time with, who you should date, whatever it is, whatever people you should spend time around, if you want to know, God, is this your will for me? And yet you know before you it could lead you into sin? The answer is right there. No, it's not. God's will, when it's revealed, always has to do with being more sanctified. So let's talk about that word sanctification for a second. If you look at it there in the text, this is the will of God, your sanctification. The root word there of sanctification is where we get our word holiness, agios. And it's interesting, the the idea of sanctification, I encourage you to go read back in passages like Leviticus 19 to 21. If you get some free time in your Bible study this week, do some devotional reading back there you will find this reoccurring statement that God says, be holy or be sanctified as I am holy. Literally, holiness and sanctification is to be like God. It's to be utterly separate from sin. So the call of sanctification is not compare yourself to the person next to you. It's not go be sanctified and work on this based on your previous performance. It is compare how you're doing to who God is in that area. Sanctification, to be utterly separate from sin, to be like God in an area. Now, sanctification is used oftentimes like it is here to speak about what happens to us after salvation. So we put our faith in Christ, we trust in him, we get saved, we're regenerated, we're declared righteous from heaven, and then we have a process of sanctification where we grow and become more in practice what we are in position. You understand that? We are positionally righteous, and now we strive for more righteousness, sanctification. Sanctification, though, is also used to speak about our position. Like 1 Corinthians 6.10, it says you have been sanctified. Literally, in salvation, God set you apart from sin and now views you as holy because of his Son. This passage is speaking of the prior, the progress of sanctification. How do we know that? Well, look at the text. That each of you... Abstain from, sex, uh, excuse me, the will of God, your sanctification. And then he goes on to exhort us that you abstain from sexual immorality. So this is a call to be sanctified and be holy like God in the realm of purity. Now, if you're looking there at the text, I'm going to give you something that I think is really going to help you and has been a help to me as I thought about this. The text actually breaks down If you look at it, after he says, this is the will of God, your sanctification, look at the top of verse 3. Verses 3, 4, 5, and 6 break down into really four commands. So if our point is, the motivation is, we are pursuing purity because it's God's will. And the next question you might ask is, well, what does it look like to pursue God's will in the area of of sanctification as it relates to purity? I'm glad you asked because Paul gives us four commands. You notice them, they're right there in the text. He's going to give us two things to do and two things to avoid. So if you say, what is God's will for my purity? Here's two things you do and two things you avoid. I want you to see this in the text. Notice, verse 3, look at it closely. This is the will of God, your sanctification. And then he says, here's two things you need to do, two commands. Abstain, there's the first one, from sexual immorality. And two, in verse 4, here's your second command. Possess your own vessel in sanctification and honor. So God's going to say to us here today, I have through the Paul, and I'm going to tell you, here's God's will for your life, Cornerstone Bible Church. It's your sanctification and personal purity. Two commands to do. You are to abstain and you are to possess your own vessel. That's the two things you're to do. Now, what are the two things you're to avoid? The text turns in the negative. Notice verse 5. Those are the two things you're to do in three and four. Now here's two things you're to avoid. Verse five, don't live like a pagan. Don't live like a pagan. Verse five, not in lustful passions like the Gentiles who do not know God. And the second thing you're to avoid, here's the command, and that no one, the command idea, let no one transgress and defraud his brother in this matter. What is the matter? In the area of sexual sin. 
So if you're looking at this text and you want to go home and study it later, here's what I could say to you. This is the will of God. Two things to do, two things to avoid. For the rest of our time today, we're going to spend the two, on the time on the two things to do. Next time, we'll get to the things we're going to avoid. So let's look at those. The will of God for our lives, for sanctification in sexual purity, has two things for us to do. Notice the first one there. It's in the middle of verse 3. That you abstain from sexual immorality. What does it mean to abstain? Probably want to understand this and think about it because it has to do with God's will for our life when it comes to the area of purity. Well, abstaining is an interesting word group and an interesting idea because it has the idea of keeping your distance from something. So its first and most basic premise is, if you're going to live a sexually pure life, then you need to watch your proximity and keep your distance, abstain, stay away from that which could lead you to sin. I know this is very basic, but I used to tell young people, and I still do all the time when they're struggling with purity, struggling, falling into sin, I usually say something like this. I have never seen a person get eaten by a shark that wasn't swimming in the ocean. I've literally never saw someone fall off a cliff from flat ground. So why are you swimming in the water and why are you on the edge of the cliff, young person? Abstain means get out of context, run from environments, get away from that which could lead you into sin. God's will for our life is we avoid that which could lead us into temptation. I know we say all that and we go, yes, but isn't it the human heart's tendency to just get as close to the ledge as we can without falling? I mean, we tell our kids all the time, the question you ask children is not how close you can get to the edge, but how far you can stay away. And we're thinking, yeah, and they're like, oh, wow, that's really good. I might go close to the edge again, but that was a good point. But we can be the same way. We don't just say the most basic thing to ourself. Soul, self, when it comes to the area of temptation, abstain. Keep distance from that which could harm you. But that's not all abstaining means. Abstaining doesn't mean just avoiding things externally. Abstaining also has the idea of dealing with things internally right? We have temptations that come from without, do we not? We have temptations from around us that come in upon us and want to pull us into sin. We also have that old long problem of the old man, the echo of the old man, and we have evil desires from within, do we not? You can be going right along, living for the Lord, singing the songs we sang today, and we were praising the Lord, and then all of a sudden something comes up in your heart, something tempts your mind, and you're like, what in the world is going on? I didn't look for that. I didn't search for that. But there it is. This is the reality that even of believers, once we've been born again, we still fight the flesh. The flesh is riddled with evil desires that arise from within. It's the perfect storm when you get a temptation from without that appeals to a desire from within. Now you've got your battle. Abstaining also has the idea of winning the war within. Listen to 1 Peter 2.11, same word. Abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against your soul. You've got these inner terrorists, some have called it, who are waging war against you and their location, their battleground, their bunker is in your heart. And Peter says, abstain, battle them. Well, how do you battle things inside of you, in your heart? How do you keep distance from them? Well, that's the second way this word is used. It has the idea of not embracing, not entertaining something. So think about that for a second. You say, pastor, I understand, you know, the Joseph and Potiphar principle run. I understand the context I'm not supposed to be in, but how do I abstain when things start to rise up in my heart? How do I deal with that? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. I think we can answer that question once we identify what we're up against. Notice, he says that when we're battling even at the heart level and we're battling in the inner life level, we have to know what we're up against. And so notice the text. Abstain from things from without and things from within that are of what quality, what substance? Look in the text. Sexual immorality. Sexual 
in morality. He wants us to abstain from sexual immorality. What is sexual immorality biblically? If we're going to know how to battle from without, and we're going to know how to battle from within, and we're going to win this war within, and we're going to win the war without, we better know our enemy. For to go into battle and not know what you're up against is to ensure you're going to lose. Right? We know this. So what is sexual immorality biblically? It's the word pornea. It's where we get our modern word pornography. It's often used of adultery. Matthew 5 and Matthew 19, Jesus speaks of adultery, abandoning marriage to someone else. It's also used of fornication, sexual acts outside of marriage. So anything that tempts us or pulls us in to sexual actions that are different from God's design. Well, what is God's design? God's design for sexual fulfillment is within his boundary. And from the garden to the grave, it never changes for us. It's one woman, one man, in the confines of a marriage relationship, sexual desires are righteously fulfilled, and that is God's design. God draws the boundary. One man, one woman in marriage. There it is. Anything outside of that is sexual immorality. That's it. Anything. Sometimes when I'm doing premarital, I try and help, you know, young, soon to be married couples grasp this. And I'll say, you know, sexual desires to be fulfilled in the right context are righteous. Sexual actions can be righteous, but outside of the right context, they're actually destructive. And I said, just think of it like a fire. A fire does really well in a fireplace. Like the fire in your living room, you burn the house down. That's basically how we ought to think about sexual immorality and righteous desires for sexual fulfillment. In the right context, righteous. Outside of that context, pornea is the word. Unrighteous sexual immorality. That term also covers, by Jesus, sexual immorality. Matthew 15, 19 and 1 Corinthians 5 and 6, homosexuality. This is a deviation. This is a departure from God's design, which is obvious when you think about anything about one man, one woman in marriage. So this is very important because let's go back to the meaning of the word abstain. Abstain is to not entertain, to not pull something in and think on it and dwell on it and let it go around in your heart and make itself a seat at the table. It's the idea of don't let it in. Keep it out. Abstain. Fight from it. Fight against it, excuse me. So how do you do that? How do we abstain from temptations from without and temptations from within? Well, from the authority of this text, here's one thing you can say to yourself when you want to abstain from these porneas, these sexual immoralities. You can just stop and say to yourself, no matter how good that sounds, how appealing that is, God, I know your word, and I know what 1 Thessalonians 4 says. This is not your will for my life. You have better for me. You can satisfy me. You can fulfill me. You are the one I can look to. You're the one I can trust. Only inside your design can I actually live in a way that pleases you. This is not your will for my life. In fact, I might even encourage you to say you could pray this in your battle for purity and say, Lord, I want to honor you. I want to please you. I want to live for you. And I know that what I'm tempted towards is not your will for my life. And I want to live in your will. And you know what you do then? You start thinking on the things that God wants in your life. What is God's will for your life? Purity. You can go over and borrow from Paul in Philippians 4 eight, whatever is pure, honorable, right. Dwell on these things. Don't you think it's interesting? Paul's taught this church on this. He's exhorted this church on this. They're doing well on this. And he's just back to the same old basics of renewing their mind about the important truths of Scripture and fighting and abstaining internally and without. Because he knows that we let our guard down. Do we not? I mean, I bet you even today, Some of you will leave here and say, I needed to be reminded of that. It's not that I'm failing in this area, but man, I'm not as urgent as I should be. I'm not striving like I should be. I'm not excelling still more. I'm not examining every area of potential temptation, targeting it as a deviation anytime it's outside of God's design and running from it, fleeing from it, renewing my mind. But that's God's will for you. Abstain. Do not entertain. 
it in your heart, in your actions, in your life. It's interesting, we won't get to it today, but this is what pagans do. Verse five, don't abstain and don't live in lustful passions like the Gentiles who do not know God. What characterizes people that do not know God? They're not abstaining, rather they're owned by their lusts. They're owned by their passions. They dominate their life. You meet an unbeliever or someone that falls into sin and you say, what happened? They say, I don't know. I was just taken over by my passions. They just got the best of me and I was gone in the moment. Yeah, you're living by your passions and your instincts. That's what pagans do. People that know God have those same temptations, but they are taking those captive to the truth of God's word and abstaining from them and fighting them and living a sanctified, righteous life because they love God, they love his glory, and they say, this is not your will for me. I must resist this because it honors you. This is Christianity, beloved. So that's the first thing that he commands us to do. If you're going to live a sanctified life according to personal purity of these four kind of command ideas. Notice it back in the text. This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Secondly, here's the second command that's in the positive. We'll get to the negatives next week. We'll wrap up with this for this morning. That each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. You could just write, I need to know how to possess my vessel. If you look close at it, it says each of you is to know. It's probably better to translate that to know how. Each of us is to know how to possess our vessel in sanctification and honor. And notice it says each of you is to know how. Now, let me put this against something else, and I don't want to speak too strongly, but I think it's important. He's putting the emphasis on you with your God before God living a holy sanctified life. Listen, you can get accountability partners, but you can lie to them. You can get programs and all kinds of things to get around sexual temptation, but you can get around them. The one thing you cannot escape is God. He knows what our eyes see. He knows what our ears hear. He knows the thoughts that happen in our mind. He's always present. He's always with us. He's always around. And the sole motivation that will actually keep you from living a life that falls into sin is to live a life and possess your own vessel before God. He is the only driving motivation that can ultimately keep a person from going into this sin because you fear him, you love him, you know him, you want to honor him. This is what Christians do. Nothing stops a person from going into these types of sins than reminding myself, I'm responsible before you, God. I can lie to other people and no one else can see, but you do, and I want to honor you. So let's look at it. What does it mean to live in the will of God and possess your own vessel, to know how to do it in sanctification and honor? Well, possess here is the idea to have mastery over something, to to have something given to you and to give good oversight to it. So that's the word for possess, to have something given to you and to possess it and own it and have mastery over it. So what are you to have mastery over, dear ones? Well, look at the text. You're to have mastery over your vessels. Vessels is a word that can be used of tools or instruments. It's also a really great way God uses um, to describe how he made us. Romans 9, 21 and 22. 2 Timothy 2, 20 and 21. Vessels were made for honor, fashioned by God, images of God, image bearers of God, made by him to be used for his glory. So this is both body and soul. So to live a pure life and in the will of God, you're to know how to possess, have ownership over your vessel, your body. God didn't make us image bearers of himself so we would use our body, our vessels on self. He made us and fashioned us so that our bodies and our souls and our minds would be used for his glory. So the idea is this. Every part of you was created by God. Think about that. Everything that is about you that makes up who you are, from your toes to your eyeballs, were created by God. To possess your vessel is to say, I have mastery and control by the Spirit, under the Word, of every part of what has been fashioned by God for His glory. There's no part of me that's living in impurity. There's no part of me that's running after these things. All of me is under 
control of God's word and God's spirit. I know how to possess this vessel God has made me. He's fashioned me into a, a vessel of humanity with a soul and this body, and it's to be filtered, uh, it's to be funneled through with a purpose to be pure and holy, the absence of sensuality. Full mastery. By the Spirit's power, we don't do this on our own. You can't do this on your own. This is the Spirit's work as we obey His word. But when you think about it that way, it's kind of convicting, right? When you think about every single area of your life, everything God has fashioned in His beautiful glory, making you an image bearer, making you uh, in His perfect likeness, putting us on earth, all of you is to be pure. No wonder, he says, excel still more purity. Certainly we don't live this perfectly. We struggle in this. Repentance and confession are obviously a, a common thing, but that even means we're considering where we're deviating and getting our vessel back under control as we take it to the word. So what's the realm that we need to have full control and authority over our body, our vessel? We'll look at it. He says there's two realms actually. In sanctification, look back in the verse there at the end of four, and honor in sanctification and honor sanctification there means a devotion an unbeliever uses their vessel for impure things you now use your vessel for pure things it's sanctified and set apart from sin and then honor honor wow don't we need the word honor in our day what a lost word nobility dignity something that's highly valued our culture is full of filth and shame and sinfulness, and we are to possess our body in honor. It's the word used of Christ in 1 Peter 2, 7. So to dishonor something is not to give it proper respect. That's what the word means, uh, to dishonor. To honor something is to hold it up and esteem it highly. So God has created you, and every aspect of you is to be dignified. It's to be honorable. It's to be virtuous. You are to be living with your bodies in purity, with honor. That might mean for us men, we'll be careful and thoughtful when we think of image bearers of God, other women, that they were not created as vessels for personal pleasure, but created as vessels to be treasured, only created for fulfillment inside God's design. For ladies, it might be you being very careful about vanities, very careful about things you let your heart drift to, realizing that I need to be honorable, dignified, careful. So that's what he says to do. He says you are to possess your vessel in sanctification and honor. So our time's gone. Next time we're going to cover some more. And what's interesting about next time is we'll get into the negatives and then a massive warning. And there's a lot to consider on why a strong believer needs to be warned. We'll talk about that. There's a lot to think about, about why he gives such strong exhortations to believers not to defraud each other. And that he warns that God's wrath could come upon someone that professes Christ that lives this way. There's a lot to discover. But for today, let's just review what we covered. Four motivations for a pure life. The first greater purity is needed. The second, it's God's will for you, that you abstain from sexual sin positively and you possess your body in sanctification and honor. So I thought I'd do this, Cornerstone. We'll wrap up with this. I'm gonna read verse one because I see Cornerstone Bible Church all over verse one. You're doing well, you're striving, but let me just conclude by rereading the verse to you and exhorting you with it and then we'll pray because that's what this church would have been thinking. Man, Paul, you are bringing it to us. Let's remind ourselves of the good work that God has been doing in us and yet let's excel still more. So let's close with this. Verse one. Finally then, brethren of Cornerstone, I request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you've received biblical instruction on how to walk and please God just as you actually are, excel still more, beloved. Let's keep growing in purity. Amen.